Hello from RPG Mods Fan. I have broken up my walkthrough, review, and discussion of the D&D S4 The Lost Caverns of Sojkath module into three parts. This is the third part of my walkthrough of the module. This video will go over the adventure's timeline of events, discuss the dungeons portion of the adventure, and I will give my closing remarks about the module. Thus, it is meant for Dungeon Masters only. Hence, there will be spoilers ahead, and players should not watch this video. As FYI, next week I will combine all three parts into one video and release it. Hello and greetings. I am Anya, Anya of Roga T. No, sister of Red Sonia. I am here, in the Lost Caverns of Sojkanth. It is awfully dark and creepy in here. On behalf of RPG Mods fan, I will be narrating most of the rest of this video. I will now discuss the module's timeline of events. Nearly a century ago, the Archmage Igawil and her evil minions conquered the marches of Perrinland. Vast amounts of loot and treasure were sent to Igawil's lair. Then the Lost Caverns of Sojkanth was discovered, and Igerwilf relocated there, and ruled her domain from there. She conducted many arcane experiments and rituals from there, trying to further increase her powers. In one of her experiments, she accidentally freed the demon prince Grazist. Although initially successful, she was unable to keep Grazist imprisoned for long, and her power was drained. Enemy armies approached Perrinland, and Igerwilf's former henchmen and slaves stole her treasure, and scattered to the four winds. Igerwilf used the last of her power to prepare a hiding place in the caverns for her remaining wealth. Legends say that this included several tomes of great power, and the fabled lamp called Da'ud's Wondrous Lanthorn. What the legends do not say, is that Igerwilf had her vampiric daughter, Drelnza, placed with the treasure to guard it. The caverns were once again lost, until recently. The caverns are thought to be somewhere east of the town of Crestable. The rulers of Ius, Perinland, Veluna, and Ket have sent expeditions into the Yattle Mountains seeking the location of the caverns, which, so far, have failed. The player character's party is sponsored by the Margrave of Bissell to locate the lost caverns of Sojkanth, and to secure its treasure for the Margrave. Perinland, Ket, Veluna, and Ayuz, are all rivals and enemies of Bissell, and have sent their own spies and adventurers to find the caverns, and or thwart others from finding it. In particular, all these rulers want Daoud's wondrous lanthorn. Given how treasure-hungry they can be, does the dungeon master really expect the player characters to hold up their end of the bargain? Hence, have all the characters be willing to go under a Hayer's spell? Or, have the Margrave's mage or cleric, along with their bodyguard accompany the party. The spellcaster and their bodyguard should be, at least two levels above the player characters. In addition, they view the player characters as cannon fodder, and will hang back and avoid combat. The adventurers traverse a mountainous region that is filled with natural hazards and monsters. They stumble upon a friendly gnomish settlement. Here, they have found a haven, and can safely rest and recuperate. South of Perrinland's borders, and within Ket's northern border, the adventurers find the lost caverns of Sojkanth. This two-level dungeon crawl is filled with monsters, traps and dangers. Entering the central chamber at the lower level, presents a puzzling challenge to the player characters. It is basically a teleport puzzle. When they finally do manage to enter the final chamber, the adventurers will see Drelnza, Igerwilf's vampiric daughter, asleep in the chamber, along with fabulous treasure, strewn all about the chamber. The mountain within which the lost caverns of Sojkanth are located in, resembles a horn. The trail leading to the cave entrance of the lost caverns is treacherous. Displayed on the screen are the maps of the lost caverns, that were printed on the back side of the module's cardstock cover. As with any typical D&D underground cavern complex, stalactites and stalagmites will be a common sight in large cavernous caverns. Beyond the outside cave entrance, there is a long descending flight of stairs, leading into the lost caverns. There are six cavern tunnel exits, from cavern number one. Beside each exit, are weird faces carved in the walls. 
Anyone approaching within one meter of any of these carved faces will activate a magic mouth that repeatedly says, turn back. This is not the way. Within the mouth of each of these will be a gem. All six gems are worth a total of 1500 gold pieces. Each mouth will bite for 3 to 12 points of damage if anyone attempts to take the gem within. This is just one example of how Gary Guy Gax was able to make unique and memorable entrances to many of his dungeons within the modules he has penned. Carved and chiseled into the walls of the grotto, marked as cavern number 6 on the map, are a series of various forms and figures. Within the grotto are seven pesh, which are short gnome-like creatures. Oops, excuse me, I meant to say vertically challenged creatures. They make their monster debut to D&D in this module. They are masters of stone, both physical and magical. They are busily working to cut a flight of stairs upwards into the mountain to a large sealed cavern. This encounter can be friendly. However, Pesh hate and shun light. So, they will initially be hostile if the adventurers are carrying torches, using continual light and such. Within cavern number 3 is a berserk clay golem. Scattered on the floor of this cavern are various sharp weapons, such as swords, axes, spears, daggers, etc. As a dungeon master, I would have all these weapons broken, which gives a big clue about the clay golem. In general, golems are nasty monsters in 1st and 2nd edition D&D. Golems can only be hit by magical weapons. In the case of a clay golem, it must be magical blunt weapons, such as hammers and maces. At the south end of cavern number 5 is a crushed minotaur skeleton. On the ceiling is a hungry lurker above. Like cavern number 7, cavern number 8 is filled with various sorts of fungus. A mummified body is wedged into a cranny at the back of this alcove-like area. Nearby is the skeleton remains of an elf who is wearing armor class 5 braces of defense. The threat of this cavern, like many of the threats in this module, comes from above. Hanging from the ceiling are four blobs of green slime. Green slimes can eat through wood and metal, including magical enchanted ones. The hapless fellow, who expired in the niche, was wounded and too afraid to attempt slipping past the green slime blobs. Yeah, it looks like that guy starved to death in there. I wonder what made him so afraid that we wouldn't want to stick his head out in. Holy crap, we are screwed! That clip was from Seth Skorkowski's video on the S4 module, which is quite funny. I want to thank Seth for allowing me to use that clip. Links to his video will be in the description section below. Living in stinking filth and refuse, in cavern number 9, are four trolls. The waters of the underground rivers and lake are ebon hued in color. However, I like to use the color maps that I found on Blogspot instead because it is easier to decipher where the rivers and lake are. Two Formorian giants inhabit cavern number 12. They love the taste of meat and have not had much variety in the caverns. Thus, the adventures will look like tasty morsels to them. Formorian giants make their monster debut to D&D in this module. The 14-foot, or 4-meter, long wooden boat has been misplaced on the map. It is supposed to be beached on the southeast side of the underground lake. Even though it has three oars, the boat is magical and can move by using command words. For every round, the player characters move across the surface of the underground lake there is a 1 in 10 chance that they will be attacked by pierces from above. In addition, there is a giant snapping turtle living in the waters of the lake. As a reminder to DMs, if a medium to heavy armor wearing player character is knocked into the water, he or she will, in all likelihood, sink. If not, then they will have difficulty swimming. Even light armored player characters will face a chance of drowning. A mated pair of cockatrices nest in cavern number 15. Feasting on the many crystals in cavern number 21 are three zorns. Zorns are not harmed by fire or cold-based spells. Electrical attacks do half damage. Zorns love to snack on metals and can smell them. Thus, they will demand such metals, including coin, from the adventurers. 
Slumbering 15 feet, or almost 5 meters, below the surface of the waters in cavern number 22, is a marid, named Kazduol. Marids are genies from the elemental plane of water, and they make their debut to D&D &D in this module. Long ago, Igerwelf placed Kazduol under a magical sleep spell. As the player characters approach the underground river's exit, they will first see an ornately carved and sculptured bridge. A distant rumbling and thundering can be heard. It is the sound of a vast underground waterfall death trap, some 100 feet, or 30 meters, in the distance. Lairing in the rainbow-colored cavern number 16, is a Gorgomera, named Chossos. Gorgomeras are cross of Gorgons and Chimeras, and they make their debut to D&D, &D in this module. In the center of the cavern is a heap of coins, and a few magic items. Cavern number 18 is richly furnished. Oriental carpets are strewn on its floor, rugs are hanging from the walls, beautiful furniture are scattered about, and plump cushions are piled on the floor. The air smells of sweet orange blossoms, and faint music, tinkling bells and chimes, can be heard. A midget dressed in orange silk pantaloons, an embroidered vest, purple slippers, and a large pale purple turban, greets the party, and says, welcome to the garden of 1000 earthly delights. Two giggling, belly dancing clad, beautiful women emerge. In the background, a menacing eunuch will try to stop the women from greeting the adventurers. Hey, cover your eyes, I am getting jealous here. Actually, go ahead, keep leering at them. See if I care about what happens next. These four creatures are actually Dao. They are the genies from the Earth Elemental Plane, and make the debut to D&D, here in this module. At cavern number 19 is another underground lake, with an island, called the Isle of Rebuke, in the middle of it. If they set foot on it, they will hear a voice, calling them fools, and tells them to flee the cavern. Six Lacedon Ghasts will swim out from area number 20, surround the island within six rounds, emerge from the waters, and attack anyone still on the island. They're a purposefully stacked pile of large well-rounded boulders at area number 17. They can be easily rolled, and they conceal a set of stairs, that lead down to the next level of the Lost Caverns of Sojkanth. One odd colored boulder is unusually light, and can be smashed open. Inside its hollow interior, is a plus one ring of protection, and graven glyphs. Funny thing is, the 1982 printing of the module, has a typo in it. In it, the ring of protection has a plus eleven enchantment. Hmm, that would explain my bikini armor. I think it has such a ring, sewn into it. Displayed on the screen, are what the graven glyphs reads. Basically, they foreshadow what is to come in the lower caverns. In order to get into central chamber number 20, the player characters must open each of the six doors from the outside. Each time they do so, they will be teleported to another location in the cavern complex. It is only on the next try, which would be the seventh try, that the player characters will finally be able to enter the central chamber. If the player characters are having trouble figuring out the teleportation corridors in areas numbered 19, then have a defeated monster have a parchment, with the following lines written on it, that are now displayed on the screen. These lines give clues, on where the teleportation corridors take them. A tribe of 18 troglodytes lair in cavern number 1. The trog's leader wields a plus one cursed broadsword, that is able to generate illusions. The walls of cavern number 2 are decorated with the calcified corpses of past adventurers. Lairing in this gruesome cavern is a bodak, another of Gary Gygax's new monsters for this module. The treasure the bodak has, which is considerable, is now displayed on the screen. Inhabiting cavern number 3, is one of Gary Gygax's most memorable monsters, which is a Bahir. A Bahir can discharge a lightning bolt, once per turn. It can also attack by biting and by constricting its prey. It is also large enough to swallow man-sized prey whole, on a high enough to hit roll. Lairing in cavern number 4, are 5 Malgoyles. Malgoyles are tougher versions of gargoyles. The treasure the Malgoyles have, is now displayed on the screen. Player characters will probably love getting the wings of flying. 
An Umber Hulk has recently burrowed up into cavern number 5. Cavern number 9 is the glowing grotto. Growing here is a luminescent lichen that gives off a soft bluish radiance akin to fairy fire. Numerous crystalline growths jut out of the walls. Anyone entering the grotto will instantly be teleported to one of four random locations lying in an alternative dimension. To the rest of the party remaining outside of the grotto, it will seem the person just disappeared and vanished from view. The Dark Labyrinth. Those who are teleported here will find themselves in complete darkness, hear snorting sounds and smell cattle. Mounted on two bulls are two minotaurs. If overwhelmed, the minotaurs will fall back into the labyrinth and use hit and run ambush tactics. I would consider the Minotaur's treasure at the location marked with the letter T as meager. The exit to the labyrinth is at location E. Those who exit will be teleported back to just outside of cavern number 9. The second possible area the teleported character can find themselves in is a featureless large room with three animated suits of armor. The only way to escape from this place is by defeating one of the animated suits of armor and donning on its helmet. The third possible teleport area is a bright sunlight canyon. Here, there are six centaurs who are also looking to escape from the canyon. Gary Guy Gax does not give box text, nor does he give a proper description of the canyon. Hence, the player characters will be stumped as to how to escape the area. The way to escape is by clearing away a gully filled with debris and rubble. To me, this area is an example of Gary's lazy writing. Hey, no one is perfect. The fourth and last possible teleport area is another example of Gary's lazy writing. The only way to escape is by levitating to the ceiling and touching all five pentacles in a five-pointed star, there. Fly spells do not work in the area. If the character does not have the ability or spell to levitate, then they can draw a pentagram on the floor, which then gives them the ability to levitate to the ceiling. As a dungeon master, I would redesign the third and fourth teleport areas. Or, I would eliminate them, altogether. Funny thing is, that is exactly what the Realms of Horror compilation book did. It eliminated the third and fourth teleport areas. Resting in the western cul-de-sac of cavern number 10, are three chasmas, which are horrible half-human half-fly demons. And, yes, chasmas are another monster that make their debut to D&D in this module. Unlike other caverns, where danger lurks from above, the danger in cavern number 11, actually lurks from below. On the floor of this cavern, is a trapper. If that were not enough, amongst its treasure, is a rug of smothering. Hiding among the stalactites and stalagmites, that have grown together, are two ropers. No, not Three's Company's ropers. Yes, those kind of ropers. The D&D version of ropers. Cavern number 13 has a dank stench of rotting fungi. Lairing in this cavern are two shambling mounds. If you want to be a cruel dungeon master, then I would have a Bahia wander into this cavern and discharge a lightning bolt onto the shambling mounds. So that they grow in size, hit points and abilities by one hit dice. Lairing in cavern number 14 is a hill giant and its pet, which is a giant rhinoceros beetle. Lairing in cavern number 16 is another one of Gary Gygax's memorable monsters, which is a Draco Lisk, which is a cross between a dragon and a basilisk. The passage to the south eventually leads up to the countryside. Long ago, one of Igerwilf's enemies made cavern number 17 a safe haven for good aligned creatures. Those who are of good alignment will be able to safely rest and recuperate here. Those who are evil aligned will constantly feel repulsed and nauseous in this cavern. Within cavern number 18, is, what appears to be, a statue of a type 4 demon. The statue is actually a stone golem, created by Igerwil. The golem will speak, and, to put it simply, the scenario is a convoluted trap to get the player characters to give up one of their magical items, before the golem, then attacks. And, finally, we have reached the central chambers of the caverns. There are six corridors that radiate out of the central chamber. Blocking entry into each of the corridors are huge iron doors. Each door has a plaque with runes on it that read 
Igerwilf's treasure rests within, her curse on any who disturb it. Seek no further to steal it, nor to free she, who is imprisoned here. For a fate worse than death, is sure to come to those fools, who violate this circumscribed place. Well, all I can say, is a poet, Guy Gax is not. The doors can be opened by three to four characters pulling on them. Beyond, the adventurers will see a long, dust-free, red marbled corridor, with a long black carpet on its floor. At the end wall of each corridor, is a huge black wooden door. Each time an ebony door is attempted to be opened, the party, including all those in the corridor, disappear, and are teleported to a square-shaped cavern. Which cavern they are teleported to, depends on which door they attempted to open. All of the six inner doors, must be opened once, followed by another try on any door, in order to enter chamber number 20. Chamber number 20 is spherical. Daoud's wondrous lanthorn bathes the chamber in warm comforting light. Drelnza appears to be a sleeping maiden, armored in golden plate mail, on top of a marble block. She was in stasis, before the doors were opened. Now, she is faking to be asleep. Hmm. I wonder, how many adventurers thought she was sleeping beauty, and tried to kiss her? She will continue to play the part of a rescued damsel, as much as possible, to use her vampiric charm ability, on as many adventurers as possible. She wields a sentient plus four bastard sword, wears plus two plate mail, and slippers of spider climbing. There are quite a bit of treasure in the chamber, and its furnishings is worth a lot of coin. If the heavy marble slab is removed from it, the marble block contains even more treasure. There is a brass cage in it, which contains various very valuable jewelry. The brass cage is actually the prison of Zagig. It is an undamageable magical prison, and is a new magic item, that is further detailed in booklet 2 of the module. Touching the cage, will free a nasty creature, called a Zeg Yi, that was imprisoned in it. A creature from the negative material plane, its touch and energy blast, can destroy wood, clothing, leather and metal. Hmm, <clears throat> just like in Gary's iconic S1, Tomb of Horrors module, adventurers in this module may end up exiting it buck naked. The heavy inside bottom of the marble block, can be removed, to reveal yet another cavity within the block. Inside, is yet more treasure, and Drelnza's coffin. If defeated earlier, Drelnza will be in it, reforming her corporeal body. In total, there are six tomes in the cavity, that can raise ability scores. There is also a bound and sealed demonomicon of Igerwild, which is a treatise on the powerful evil creatures of the lower plains, and contains a set of new magic user and cleric spells. Breaking the seal of the demonomicon, will free a Zag Yar, which is similar to the Zeg Yi, but is from the positive material plane, instead. Likewise, its touch and energy blast, can destroy wood, clothing, leather and metal. The module is considered concluded, when the player characters have defeated, the Vampire Drelnza, the Zeg Yi and the Zag Yar. Okay, back to you, RPG Mods fan. Roll credits? Displayed are the credits found within the module itself. The Lost Caverns of Solskath is one of Gary Gygax's classic adventure modules and is considered one of his best works. To me, the caverns section was a two-level monster condo. Gary tries to explain this away by saying that the Lost Caverns are at a nexus of planes. In my head canon, the monsters were bound there by Archmage Igvil's powerful magic. Despite this video being already long, I was not able to discuss Booklet 2 of the module in much detail. As mentioned before, it contains new magic items, spells, and many new monsters, including ones that have been in other modules, such as the Demilich, which appeared in the S1 Tomb of Horrors module. In general, a D&D module is supposed to contain a few new monsters. With this module, Gary went overboard. 
Overall, it is a fun module. It is supposed to contain monsters that the player characters have never encountered before, thus presenting the challenge of how to defeat them. If you have any ideas on how to make this module even better, please share them in the comments below.